This brings the total number of lab confirmed positive and probable positive cases in Manitoba to 19 at this time. And just to note that uh, we are moving to the terms probable cases and confirmed cases uh, here in Manitoba just to bring us in line with the terminology used at the Public Health Agency of Canada. We have added a page to our website that lists the dates, flights and affected uh, seats where people may have been exposed to uh, someone who later tested positive for COVID-19. This information is updated regularly as we continue our public health investigations. Manitobans are reminded that public health orders remain in effect. At this time, the public health orders uh, apply to public places, not to workplaces. However, workplaces are reminded to uh, continue their efforts at uh, social distancing strategies. Please remember that all international travellers returning to Canada are required to self-isolate uh, for 14 days upon their return. This includes those individuals entering Canada through uh, roads as well. Um, self-isolation means uh, self-isolation uh, at home for the most part. Uh, this does not mean going to the grocery store, doing shopping. This is self-isolating at home, monitoring for symptoms and calling health links should they arise. We know that the vast majority of cases in Canada and certainly Manitoba are related to international travel. And so we strongly are advising Manitobans to cancel or postpone any trips, certainly outside of uh, Canada, uh, but this advice is uh, uh, strongly given to cancelling and postponing trips outside of Manitoba as well. Now is the time for social distancing. Now is not the time for certainly non-essential travel. Not everyone needs to be tested for COVID-19. We want to ensure our lab capacity is used uh, um, efficiently and so those returning from an international trip who have symptoms of respiratory illness sh uh, should call health links for an assessment on whether to be tested or not. No one without symptoms needs to be tested. Uh, those who are contacts of confirmed cases who develop symptoms should be tested. Uh, again, uh, those who are asymptomatic, those without respiratory symptoms, there is no need to be tested. Now that school is out, I want to remind Manitobans to continue practicing social distancing. This means staying ho at home as much as possible. Do not arrange for in-person play dates with other families. Instead, uh, uh, perhaps go for walks uh, outside with, uh, with the family. We want to ensure that Manitobans are protecting themselves, protecting the people around them, and protecting our communities. To protect yourself, Wash your hands frequently. Do not touch your face. Cancel or postpone your travel plans. To protect the people around us, ensure we're covering our cough and sneeze, uh, staying home when we're ill, uh, avoiding large crowds, disinfecting regularly uh, used surfaces. And to protect our communities, we need to continue to practice our social distancing efforts. This is staying home, certainly if you're ill, uh, but staying home uh, for the most part if you can. Cancel large events, use reliable sources of information. And by protecting ourselves, our loved ones and our community, we're all doing our part to limit the impact of this virus in Manitoba. And so, as I mentioned, now is not the time for business as usual. Now is the time to uh, implement these social distancing strategies. Uh, now is the time that we can work together to limit the impact of this virus in Manitoba. So thank you uh, very much. I'll turn it to Lynette. Thank you. Good morning. I want to begin today by thanking the community for their support as we continue to respond to COVID-19. Throughout the system, clinical staff, screeners at health links, workers at the testing sites, everyone have been thanked for their efforts. Some restaurants have been nice enough to unexpectedly drop by coffee or food for the busy staff to help them throughout the day. 
Also in the last couple of days, Red River College and the Winnipeg Airports Authority have stepped forward and donated their radio and digital advertising buys to support the COVID-19 cause. So we'll be putting those ad spaces to good use in the days ahead to inform Manitobans about COVID and direct them to the proper resources. All these gestures are greatly appreciated and it's really nice to see everyone pulling together in the same direction for the greater public good. So let's keep the momentum going and uh, thanks to everyone who's helping us. In terms of operational matters, so HealthLinks uh, received, I think that's a record call of 2,300 calls yesterday and the average wait time for those calls was 47 minutes. Our online self-assessment tool received about 30,000 web views yesterday and we're up to um, more than 220,000 views since it launched on Tuesday. In terms of the community testing sites, 242 people visited the community testing sites across the province yesterday. That brings our total to approximately 3,600 people who have visit visited the screening sites since the openings began on March 9th. 85 people visited the new drive through location in Fort Gary yesterday. Additional locations throughout the province will be opening in the next few days. As a reminder, these are not walk-in clinics. People need to receive a referral to visit these sites and not everybody who is screened will be tested. Manitobans are asked to call health links to receive instructions as to whether they need to be tested. And remember that only those Manitobans with respiratory symptoms and have traveled internationally in the past 14 days or who have had direct contact with a confirmed or suspected case of COVID-19, even at a large event like conferences, flights, cruise ships, will need to be tested at this point. All other Manitobans are asked to stay home if they are sick. One last thing I wanted to speak to, which came up yesterday, and I think it was very important and I want to come back to it, is um, mental health and wellness for the public and providers. We, we really do want people to be thinking, it's, there's a lot of change and a lot of uncertainty happening right now, and that can cause feelings of stress, uh, which are normal in these circumstances and understandable. So we are encouraging people to do what they can to maintain their mental wellness in the days and weeks ahead. Take breaks, get proper rest, eat healthy, exercise, and keep connected to the people you typically reach out to in times of stress. More importantly though, if you are struggling and you need help, know that you're not alone. We will do everything in our power to ensure there are supports available to you as this situation evolves. Specifically for healthcare providers, uh, please talk to your manager or your direct report and let them know if you are, are feeling stressed or if you feel like you need extra support. There is a number of mental health resources available to help healthcare workers, including the Blue Cross Employee Assistance Program. So as well, we're also working towards developing more resources available for you to access. Our response to COVID-19, so far we feel well prepared and, and it's going it's going as, as expected, um, but it is likely to last a while. So this is really a marathon, not a sprint. We have to take care of each other um, and we need to get through this together. So thank you very much. And I will open up the floor to questions. Uh, talk about mental health. Are you hearing a lot of issues coming from your frontline workers where they are having issues with mental health? I'm not hearing that, but that's not to say it's not happening. Um, everybody's at a different phase right now. So we have some groups like Health Links and the Access Centers and the labs who are, and public health who are ramping up. We have other groups who are slowing down like surgery and endoscopy procedures and a lot of our rehab um, group work that's happening. And then we have other groups who are 
uh, in the facilities preparing um, and there's changes in terms of visitor restrictions. So everyone, there's 55,000 people who work in Manitoba's healthcare system. And I think everyone will be dealing with it in different ways. So I haven't heard it, uh, but we do have lots of um, offers of support in the community, the Canadian Mental Health Association, our own crisis response line. We have uh, occupational health. So we're gonna pull all those resources together and as things uh, evolve, we'll make sure that those supports are available for staff. Talk about some of the supports, but for practicing social distancing, are you moving to some of those supports online, so maybe more teleconferencing, that type of thing? With, well, how are you approaching that in terms of offering those supports to make sure everybody is practicing the? Yeah. Needs to be practicing? Yeah. So as much as possible, we are looking at virtual solutions. So if there's rehab. Um, classes for cardiac or uh, things like that. We're looking at how we can implement that. Um, certainly, um, the physicians are are looking at how they can do visits online. So that again, it's just changing the dynamics and the flow of the facilities uh, with with limited visitors coming to hospitals and personal care homes. Um, it changes the workload. It changes the flow of the day. And, um, but yeah, wherever there's an, either we will be decreasing services or we will be offering them in a different way. This might seem like an odd question, but uh, how are the two of you doing? Um, you, there's a lot on your shoulders, you're public facing. How are you, how are you both personally dealing with this, this crisis? Well, I mean, it's there's lots of lots of support, and and you mentioned it's the we're the public facing aspect of it, and there's a list a, a mile long of people with carrying a lot of burden and and working day and night on this. So, we uh, uh, we're in the um, uh, at the face of it, but there's a lot of people working hard, and um, and we're supporting each other, and and looking at our our typical support structures too. So, um, speaking of. of <coughs> There, there are very particular criteria for people who are being tested. My, my understanding, at least in, in other nations, is there are people who have who uh, have contracted the disease and are asymptomatic. Uh, why aren't we testing more widely? Is it a matter of logistics and capacity, or? There is a, at, at first, uh, we're, we're looking to now uh, increase our lab capacity, which we've been doing uh, all through that. So you have to focus on the most uh, at risk, and we know that uh, uh, almost all our cases are um, from international travel, and, and we know that um, almost all spread comes from symptomatic people. Uh, but we also dealing with that through our social distancing strategies, right? So we, um, uh, if there's somebody who is uh, symptomatic, we're asking you to stay home, uh, right? So uh, if you um, uh, practicing social distancing, we're not seeing large groups where there can be spread. Um, we're not. Uh, um, we're keeping our distance from other people. So there's a lot of built-in things in our strategy that protects against that asymptomatic spread should it be occurring. But we know that the predominant spread is by symptomatic individuals right now. So that's where we have to focus our efforts, but we're, we're gonna to continue to expand. Can you elaborate on how you're looking to expand your lab capacity and when we might see some of those changes? Well, we, we've been seeing it uh, uh, up to now. Uh, so the um, uh, we've been testing hundreds and hundreds of samples a day. We're hoping to get uh, uh, get back to, uh, um, uh, to substantial numbers again uh, next week. Uh, and we're going to continue to uh, to look at that. So there's there's a lot of steps with it, right? So the it comes from the actual uh, having people take the test, um, who actually take the sample, send it to the lab. Actually has to be um, uh, formatted and processed at the lab. We need the lab equipment. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, steps that go into increasing the capacity. So we we need to look at each level there. And we have we've uh, we've uh, increased the ability to test uh, continuously through here, and uh, and we're going to hope to to continue to do that. Is there a particular area where things are sort of bottlenecking? Is it doing the swabs themselves? Is it getting the samples tested? <laughs> Not necessarily. There is uh, at the national level uh, uh, last week there was a shortage in what they call the reagent, the the actual testing material, and we've um, uh, worked uh, worked at that, and it looks like um, uh, moving forward we'll be in a better position uh, with that. But there was also issues with swabs and viral transport media, so there's a lot to go into uh, uh, to increasing the capacity. So that's why we focus on the efficient use of it, testing people who are most high risk, but at 
at the same time plans in place for when we see that increased capacity, how we're going to expand. I have a question about how uh, a state of emergency that we're in right now, it affects, I'm guessing it affects a lot of things, but um, we're getting, we're hearing that it's been affecting pharmacare and it changes the way that pharmacare works and um, people are, aren't able to get as much, I guess, I guess the amount of prescription they're allowed to get is, is limited. They're only allowed, we've heard that 30 day supplies as opposed to like 90 and up is, can you speak to that or can you tell me how that works? That was one of the, um, uh, strategies that that came down was to limit the the amount of prescriptions that could be uh, filled at one time so again the fear is uh, uh, is contagious uh, and with this so we definitely want people to be preparing for this we definitely want people to be making uh, changes to their daily lives right now but there is no reason to stockpile um, goods or services or, or medications. And so we saw that in the retail sector there was some stockpiling going on. We wanted to put in place measures that would uh, decrease the risk of, of having a, uh, a shortage on essential medications. And so this was one measure that we put forward there. So uh, having that uh, you know week or two supply of things at home definitely advise everyone, but there's no reason to, uh, to stockpile anything. So that was a, a measure putting forward and we're looking at those unintended consequences that all these things can have and we'll keep revisiting them. In Nova Scotia, they declared their state of emergency and they're limiting gatherings to no more than five people. Is that a consideration that we could be moving to that small gatherings in the future? So nothing is, has ever been off the table here. We've been taking this in an incremental way. We've uh, moved to the uh, less than 50 uh, gathering when, uh, when we saw that at the national level. Uh, and so uh, we're going to look at the, um, uh, the dynamics nationally, we're looking at the dynamics worldwide and certainly what's happening here in Manitoba and we'll make uh, changes accordingly. To go back to testing for a second, I can appreciate that you're doing what you can, addressing where you know that most of the cases are coming from with what you have. How real is the possibility that the lack of resources is letting people who aren't being tested, whether it's because of because they're asymptomatic, how real is the possibility that the virus is spreading because you just, you're not able to test everyone? So we have a lot of uh, surveillance in, in place there. Um, uh, so we look at things like emergency visits, we look at uh, emergency visits for respiratory symptoms, uh, ICU admissions, hospital-based admissions. So we, we follow all these things. So these are all the syndromic surveillance that we follow. If there's, a, if there's indications that we're seeing more and more respiratory illness, we don't have to just pick it up with, with positive tests. And so we're certainly not seeing those indications right now. Um, but we have things in, in place that, that, uh, that work in that manner too. So other countries who have experienced the outbreak of COVID-19, uh, you see um, their, their hospitals, their acute care beds being overflowed and then they realize there's a problem. Uh, for us, we actually have some of the lowest number of emergency visits, medicine, bed occupancy and critical care right now. So that to us tells us there's nothing more happening in the community. It's not to say we shouldn't continue to be e extremely vigilant, but if there was community outbreak, even if there were asymptomatic um, people spreading, we would see some symptomatic people. We would see more people in the hospital. So right now, all indications look like it's good. Is all COVID-19 testing in the province right now being done at those new testing sites, or is it also being done in, in the hospital? It's being done in hospitals, so all critical care patients have been tested for COVID-19. And of course, there's clinical judgment. So if someone shows up in the hospital and they meet all the screening requirements, they, they could be tested, yeah. Uh, I know the general timeline for testing turnaround is 24 to 48 hours. Um, does that change at all if you're you know, in rural Manitoba, if you're somewhere where you're not? You don't have access to these testing sites? So the, the test turnaround uh, quoted at 24 to 48 hours is after the lab uh, sample is, is received at the lab. So if we look at a rural or remote area there, the, um, the time it takes to get that sample to the lab adds on to that turnaround time. Um, right now, uh, as of last week, there was some prioritization that needed to be done. So healthcare workers, uh, samples from long-term care facilities, samples from uh, First Nation communities or other outbreak settings uh, were prioritized. 
Uh, so people with less severe symptoms, um, that 24 to 48 hours may have been ex extended because they were requiring to uh, prioritize the samples. We're hoping that next week we're, we're going to be back to that 24 to 48 hour turnaround. I think we've asked this question quite a few times, but what can officials do to enforce social distancing? I mean, I'm sure you're seeing it, we're seeing it, we're, we're hearing phone calls saying people are, are still gathering or whatever that may be. What can, what can the province do without perhaps encroaching on civil liberties? And so this is the, 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 the balance. Uh, and again, uh, I think the vast majority of Manitobans are taking this seriously. Uh, and um, the vast majority of, of Manitobans are putting things in place to uh, work on these social distancing strategies. So certainly um, there's going to be outliers uh, to that. Uh, the um, declaration of the public health orders uh, was to strengthen that message. And so people who uh, don't necessarily act on recommendations, there's probably a greater proportion who will act on uh, legal requirements. Uh, there may be still some outliers. And we have... Uh, uh, processes in place to uh, to connect with those people, to issue uh, appropriate recommendations or warnings, um, and actual enforcement is, is very rarely actually needed, but it is uh, contemplated and possible with those with those orders. But no, clearly not at this point we're not planning on enfor enforcing. It could, it could, it could, it's a possibility, but it's not uh, something that's about to happen at this point. That's right. So the, the, the first steps would be to, uh, to reach out to, uh, to encourage compliance, to help with compliance. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, egregious issues or repeated issues, it's, it's contemplated and, and possible that um, uh, more coercive means could be uh, applied. Have you received any complaints that have had to be seriously investigated in that way? Well, we received uh, a number of um, concerns uh, from the public. And, um, and so the public health inspectors are, uh, are going to have a, a method for reviewing uh, many of these concerns, certainly triaging them. Uh, we would not have the ability to follow up on every single um, issue, uh, but uh, the public health inspectors have already uh, proactively reached out to a number in the hospitality uh, uh, businesses that were included in the, in the order to uh, advise them of their responsibilities and to answer any questions. Are currently being have reached out to, or how many complaints you guys have received? No, no, we don't have a, a method uh, uh, right now to to collate that. Anything else? Um, yeah, sorry. Um, I think this has been asked probably for the last few days, but there was the one patient in Manitoba who uh, it was not confirmed that it was 100% uh, travel related. Is there any update with that? Right, so I, d I don't have anything. Um, uh, to uh, uh, more to add to that, I would just reiterate that that remains a probable case, and so uh, we're we're still investigating things. And when you say not just for this one, when you say travel related, does that mean international travel? Always? For the uh, for the most part, it does. Uh, it, when we when we say that, there um, we we have had a, a case uh, uh, travel inter interprovincially. Uh, that was uh, that was a positive case that was linked uh, that way. But uh, for the most part, it's international travel here. But I would reiterate that uh, now is the time for social distancing. Now is not the time for non-essential travel, even um, uh, anywhere else in Canada right now. Uh, right? I would I would advise Manitobans to stay home when they can, practice good social distancing, and I would strongly caution against travel outside of Manitoba right now. Can you say where that one patient traveled to interprovincially? The uh, that one was um, uh, was British Columbia. Um, and I I don't think that you've touched on this. I know you spoke a little bit about health links. Can you talk about what kind of are you looking at alternatives to staffing to keep up with the demand? Probably only going to go up. Right? I know that. And I think it was Alberta, they looked at introducing pharmacists, things like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have quadrupled our staffing in health links over the past couple of weeks uh, with the help of senior practicum students, nursing students, as well as some retired nurses and staff who have come back to the workforce to help with that. And so far right now, um, things are moving in the right direction, partly because we added human resources, but also digital tools like the online screening and the um, phone line uh, where you can screen online, same as the uh, virtual 
screening tool. And, um, and we've also been working to expand the phone lines. So when this all started, we, I think we had about 30 phone lines for Health Links, 29, and now we have over 100. So it's just all those things put together. It's a multi-pronged approach to solving it. So, so you, you said uh, you held things and could quadruple the staff. Do you, have, do you have a rough number on, on that? I think it's about 50 people a day now. Yeah, and they are, they're 24 7, so it's different shifts that they work. We've been hearing from people who live in condos, apartment buildings where there have been confirmed cases. Building managers have been putting a sign in the lobby just informing people that there's someone in this building yeah. who has been tested positive. Um, is that something that you recommend? Do you think it? It instills more panic than it does good. That's right, and and you know we've uh, we've investigated a number of these type uh, type of issues, and often have found that in fact there isn't a case in those in in some of those buildings. So we would um, we would caution uh, against that. Remember this this virus is spread almost exclusively through close prolonged contact with a symptomatic individual, and so if a person is uh, self isolating appropriately, the um, there is really uh, limited risk to uh, to anyone else in say a, a building uh, that they're sharing frequent hand washing is important for everyone uh, but um, uh, you know, th that fear is uh, you know is contagious uh, and we, we need people to use credible information if you were determined to be a close contact to a confirmed case public health will be reaching out to you with instructions uh, and so do the day-to-day -day things washing your hands uh, keeping that social distancing from everyone, not just people you might uh, suspect that has uh, has the case, but um, uh, uh, but public health will be doing um, exhaustive contact follow-up. So if you're a close contact to a confirmed case, public health will be in contact with you. We've also been hearing from people who are worried about not confirmed cases of COVID-19, but friends or neighbors, for example, who they know have just gotten back from international travel and who are not self-isolating. Can people do anything in that situation? So we want to, you know, continue that, to strengthen that message that, um, uh, that almost all of our cases, uh, probably all of our cases right now are, are uh, related to travel. And so really need uh, people to, to do their part to self-isolate upon return from international travel right now. And so we don't really have uh, much of a, a process in place to be, um, you know, reporting individuals, you know. So this is, this is the time for Manitobans to be working together. And so when we hear people concerned, I think it's, it's good that Manitobans are taking this seriously. I think most Manitobans are. So we get these reports of different maybe travelers that they think aren't self-isolating or reports of uh, businesses that might not be doing social distancing. So uh, it's good that people are paying attention. It's good that people are taking this seriously. But this is, this is a time for Manitobans to, to uh, work together. Uh, you know, and, and it's everyone has that role, and it's only if, if everyone starts playing that role that we're going to limit the, the spread of this virus. So in those situations, you would recommend that they reach out to that person and remind them of what's being recommended or what actually can they do? I don't, you know, I don't think my advice would be for people to approach other uh, other people and, 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 and advise them of this. Um, uh, we're going to continue our messaging out uh, out to people. Uh, if they, um, you know, had concerns, then uh, they could, uh, you know, discuss it with public health. Um, but we wouldn't have the ability to investigate people, investigate their travel plans, and uh, and do this. So, uh, but we are continually looking at ways to get that message out and to bolster our, our message. So you saw with the um, uh, issuance of public health orders. So that's certainly not uh, unlikely to be the final iteration of those orders. Uh, so the, we are going to continue to see what what other things we need to place in orders such as that to uh, to ensure our message is strong. Uh, there are regions in the United States, for example, which obviously the situation there is very different than it is here. There are areas there where they have essentially given up on testing because they've lost the containment battle. Can you talk about where we are in relation to that? Well, we're at um, 19 cases right now that uh, um, almost all of them we can link to, to travel. We're not seeing increased utilization of our healthcare system, increased visits uh, with, uh, with respiratory illness. So we are still working in the containment uh, phase of this uh, outbreak. 
Um, but we have been planning for mitigation steps all along. And in fact, we've implemented mitigation strategies, right? The social distancing strategies aren't used in containment. They're used in when we see community-based transmission. And so we have uh, implemented those before we've had evidence of this, right? So we don't usually um, suspend schools or, uh, you know, or childcare uh, until we see sustained community-based transmission, none of which we saw. So we are uh, ahead of this, and we're hoping that that's going to really allow us to flatten that curve. Um, we will see community-based transmission here in Manitoba, um, but uh, we're going to hope to limit the impact. And I just wanted to follow up on the three doctors who were at the bond spiel, and I believe it was Edmonton. Uh, are there any updates on them? I don't have uh, specific updates on, on individuals. No. So those cases haven't been confirmed or...? I wouldn't comment on, on specific individuals. I just wanted to, just, just to clarify one last point. Uh, you said we, we will see community transmission. We want to limit the spread. Is, am I reading that correctly? Like it's, it's kind of inevitable, inevitable at this point? I think, I think if you look at it in, the, uh, in other jurisdictions, we're, we're going to do what we can to contain it. Right, so we, we certainly have not given up our containment phase. Uh, but uh, the more and more you see this virus introduced into your um, region, uh, the more likely you're going to see community-based transmission. So we are uh, definitely prepared to see that uh, at all levels of the healthcare system. And, um, and I think we, we need to anticipate that. Uh, so do you have any information about at what point those doctors self-isolated? Was it immediately when they returned or when they colleague in Saskatchewan was tested positive? I don't, I don't have information on in individuals here like that. Know, so. Just in terms of uh, the resources we have for healthcare staff here, if, they, if their tests are negative, are they immediately cleared to go back to work? No, no. So if you are a, uh, a close contact to an uh, infected case or if you are a returned international traveler, the incubation period is 14 days. So even if you showed symptoms and tested negative, say another type of respiratory illness, that does nothing to change your incubation period. You could be still incubating that, that virus. So negative tests don't get you out of an incubation period. Do you know what specialties they practice? No, in? no, I don't, I don't have information. I've heard people saying that. I believe it was the day they were at the bonds bill was the day that the new coronavirus was declared a pandemic by the World Health mm -hmm. Organization. At that point, we were pretty far into this thing. Was it, do you think they should have known better than to go to something like that? Well, with their you know, and, and again, I think this is the, you know, uh, this is that time for for our Manitobans to be to be working together to implement uh, these things. So we've had, I mentioned that all of our cases are from returning travelers. That's in no way to to um, uh, put blame on them, uh, right? It's we're we're working together to. They presented for testing. They were self isolating, and so I'm not here to to judge people's uh, actions. I'm here to uh, to try to inform them properly. So I I wouldn't be in a position to to make a, a statement like that about uh, about whether they should have been there or not. That's it. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys.